Welcome again and welcome back. Let me now introduce our next bright star in our series of fireworks throughout this five-day week of Aspen AI Berlin Conference. Let me introduce Isabella Hermann, who will moderate the conversation with Martin Ford and Wendy Hall. Isabella is a political scientist with a specialization on international relations and the questions how discourses on new technologies determine global power structures. Looking into the future is exactly what we wanted to put at the end of this five-day conference, because we think that this is the right way to end the whole thing. But before that, Isabella, the floor is yours, and please introduce your panel. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, yeah, welcome everyone also from my side. Um, great that you have tuned in for the very last and very interesting uh, event of the Aspen AI Week. Um, a two-on-one conversation with Dame Wendy Hall and Martin Ford. So welcome the two of you. Um, as for the procedure, the three of us will now have a conversation, a talk for around 35 minutes or so. And after that, I try to have two or three questions from you, the virtual audience. So just post your questions in the Q&A section um, in the Zoom conference. So time is short, so better get started. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Martin Ford a futurist and entrepreneur. And he's quite renowned for his New York Times best-selling book, Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. And also a very warm welcome to Dame Wendy Hall, Regius Professor of Computer Science at the University of Southampton, and one of the two authors of the influential independent UK government report, Growing the Artificial Intelligence Industry in the UK from 2017. So I'd like to start with you, Wendy. Um, one of the major ideas of the report um, was the creation or the establishment of data trusts. So could you please elaborate a bit on the idea and tell us why they matter and where we are at right now when it comes to data trusts. Thank you very much um, and thank you for inviting me to uh, be here today. Um, well, the first thing to say is that I've said this quite often in public, when we were doing the report, Jerome and I, um, we had to decide on the recommendations and um, the order they came in. Um, and we were working with um, the politicians, the, 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 well, the, the civil servants at number 10, who were helping us frame it in a way that um, the politicians would be keen to sign off on. And um, they wanted us to put skills first, which of course would have made a lot of sense. Uh, but we actually, from the soundings we took from businesses, large and small, we had decided um, that what we were hearing back was one of the biggest issues was how people share data in order to develop new AI systems. The small companies were talking about the, the fact that it's not a level playing field and that um, it's very difficult for small companies, even if they've got the most wonderful algorithm, to get access to the data they need to train it. Um, and of course, this was one of the reasons why DeepMind um, our, which grew out of the UK and has been doing some amazing work, um, uh, turned to Google for uh, investment. Um, and, and also large companies, um, it, it was a question of, well, if we're going to share our data, under what can, terms and conditions do we do that? And then you've got the issue, of course, that some of that data, in fact, probably the majority of it, is cannot be open data. It um, will be either company commercial commercially confidential or it will be personal data, um, data that needs to be kept very secure. There's all sorts of reasons why you can't just throw it out there. So we felt that this was one of the biggest issues and we already that we had to tackle going forward. And so we put that as our first recommendation that the UK should invest in developing um, rate rules and regulations and processes and the guidelines and help for industry and the public sector. Um, to set up um, what we call data trust. Now, in fact, um, 
they're, they're, uh, they're now they're called all sorts of things now um, in the UK we have something called trust law and, and some people argue that data trusts have to be set up under trust law which is quite a specialized law uh, that might work for some instances generally it's going to be uh, contract law that you um, shape in a way that works for the uh, data trust or institution or whatever you call it um, uh, it's going to be set up um, and if, and um, I, sh I shouldn't talk for too long because there's a whole story here, but um, the um, whilst there was a lot of um, agreement that this was uh, something we should do, we didn't put, I don't think, enough money into developing those. It was sort of assumed it, they would um, they would bubble up. Well, if they didn't for a while, but during COVID, they really have. And, in, and I, I assume that's happening around the world. During the last year, people have suddenly dis have. have it, the, the idea that you need to share data to actually achieve the analysis you want to achieve across data sets that are owned by different organizations and have very different terms and conditions and formats and anything else um, uh, has, has become so acute during the, COVID, during the pandemic um, to try and help us analyze what's going on. But in the UK, certainly, we've seen a number of initiatives bubbling up um from grassroots to to set up these types of um sharing agreements and um you're going to see a number of reports coming out in the new year i'm sure the eu are going to do something about it i've seen reports from india um very interesting ones um about how they're handling this and certainly in the uk we have a new national data uh, strategy emerging and there will be other reports about uh, this type of thing coming out about and the issue is around um, the balance between what government has to regulate what what companies and uh, data owners will do for them do themselves um, and and how they're going to be implemented and how they're going to be used and I see it as a very exciting um, time for this type of work and it will really help um, drive the AI industry forward. Thank you. So, in fact, you have already answered my next question. If um, COVID-19 has accelerated the process, um, but just another question and add on. So in your report, you were quite positive about job creation and uh, the future of employment. So could you just briefly describe where you see the biggest chances also in relation to data trusts that we understand a bit more what the linkage is between job creation and data trusts well it's a little hard and maybe someone like martin is better versed in doing this sort of thing but we we are talking about jobs we don't have names for yet and we don't know what they're going to be i always give the example my father uh, uh, who was born in 1919 was an accountant um, and he spent his entire career um, actually he would probably just call himself a clerk in the, but he was an accountant he managed the company's books and they were that books and everything they did was pen and paper and he divided pound shillings and pence remember those um, he divided pound shillings and pence by pound shillings and pence either in his head or on paper um, he could add up a sum anyway he did they did everything and of course they had to copy everything there were ledgers where we get the terms from um, everything and of course all those jobs have gone right nobody does has um, none of those jobs exist today but the finance industry employs more people than it ever did uh, uh, in, and what, what the use of computers, of course, calculators first and then computers, you take the drudge out of the job so that it frees us to do more creative things that the computers help us to do. And you get this sort of circle of growth where, and sometimes it goes wrong because um, sometimes the computers enable us to do things we don't understand. And partly that's what caused the financial crash in 2008. But the, the, the this circle of growth whereby you have new ideas, computers help you to achieve a new type of investment or a new type of uh, analysis of company or whatever, and the whole sector grows. Now, in terms of data trust, we, we absolutely are going to need people People because of the issues around in, in AI in terms of the ethics of AI and, and, and we've got to worry about bias in algorithms and in data 
and um, how we make sure that the uh, you know the, the the right answers are emerging for the for, for whatever the, the target their clients are and all the how we, how we verify validate this industry regulate this industry there are jobs around all of that I, um, and just you know things data auditing data quality control um, all these uh, types of uh, jobs will emerge. Uh, there's a lot of work for lawyers as well, I should say, in all this. So <laughs> it's another growth area. Um, uh, so, th uh, yes, there are going to be um, far more jobs now in this type of sector than we could even conceive of today. Of course, there are people that will lose their jobs to automation. And, and there, there is, you know, history tells us there will be short term losers. Uh, and that's what governments have to manage, is people who lose their jobs to automation and don't have the skills or the ability to retrain or find other work. But, yeah. um, and of course, when we did the report in 2017, we weren't, we weren't expecting a pandemic to hit three years later, which has distorted everything again, of course. But, you know, it's, it's um, increased the demise of some industries and will increase the rise of others, which is very interesting. So thank you. I mean, this, of course, now leads me to um, Martin Ford. I mean, since the byline of your book is a uh, threat of a jobless future, I might guess you have a bit a different take um, on, on the future of work. So how do you see it, the future of employment and job creation? Yeah, I'm generally uh, characterized as being uh, obviously a bit more pessimistic on that. Um, which is not to say that I disagree with what Wendy said. I mean, I think absolutely that new jobs will be created as a result of, of these advances. Um, but I also think a lot of jobs will be destroyed. And there are two questions there. Uh, one is overall, is the job creation going to be sufficient to, to um, counteract that job destruction? And the second question is really, what about specific groups of people? Um, and I, I worry about both of those, especially in the long run. Once we get out, you know, beyond 10 years, I think that the impact of this could be truly dramatic, could be, could be um, such that really we see a lot more destruction than we see creation. Um, and in particular, you know, you, you know, as Wendy said, there are going to be people that benefit from this in the sense that their, their jobs become less dull, less boring, and, and artificial intelligence enables them to be more creative. But of course, those tend to be the people that are already kind of at the top of the pyramid in terms of the kind of cognitive work that they're doing, right? They're people that are going to tend to be fairly well educated, maybe extremely well, um, and people that are already doing things that are generally non-routine, you know, more intellectual, that type of work. Uh, but there's a whole group of other people that come to work and they do things that for the most part are fundamentally routine and repetitive. And by that, I don't necessarily mean doing exactly the same thing again, like, like standing on an assembly line in a factory, but they tend to face the same types of challenges. Uh, and what that means is that a lot of what they do is going to be susceptible to machine learning. There's going to be data that, that essentially encapsulates what they're doing. And eventually there'll be algorithms that will be able to churn through that data and figure out what they're doing and more and more of those jobs are going to fall to automation and that might be white collar work that clerical type work uh you know things like like uh, bookkeeping accounting things like that we're already seeing a big impact or of course it's also factory work it's work in, in uh, warehouses where robots are getting better and better and better so i think eventually we reach a point where there's some significant sub subset of people that, that really are best equipped to do fairly routine things. Um, and, and, you know, routine work in general is just kind of, kind of evaporate. And, and some of those people will successfully transition to other areas, but I think a lot of them will struggle. Uh, well, we're going to have to come up with a solution to that. And, and I'm a bit skeptical that the solution is the traditional things that we've done in the past like job retraining and reskilling and, and you know more education, things like this. And then the reason is at least that if you look in the United States, uh, these kinds of programs don't have a very good track record. I mean, I mean, back when globalization was was the problem, when when the factories started to close in the Rust Belt, you know, the industrial Midwest in the United States, there were job retraining programs and the, and, and the track record of those in terms of what they were actually able to do for the people that were impacted were uh, really not very good. So I think that 
we're going to have to sort of reconsider the tools in our toolbox in order to adapt to all of this. And that's one reason that um, I've been an advocate eventually of having something like a universal basic income, just to supplement everyone's income and make sure that everyone meets some kind of, um, you know, minimum threshold so that, so that people can have a decent life. And I think eventually that's going to become essential, pretty much essential for most, for most countries. When you, did you um, directly wanted to answer or? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, I guess. Oh, I thought you'd mute to me. Anyway, um, so I wanted to just echo what Martin said. I, I totally agree with that. And I, um, I think we need, and, and, and actually we have seen it in COVID as well, the need for it, uh, because so many people are losing their jobs. I'm sure it's the same in the US because of COVID, not just because of automation, because they're, you know, the, the, the sorts of jobs they did, the industries they did are just, are just dying and may or may not um, come back again. Um, the, the need for some sort of um, to value people who may not be, have the um, white collar knowledge skills to do the sort of high end jobs that, that we're talking about here, but are hugely important to the community. And we've seen how we need people to help in the community, to help people who can't help themselves. And um, and I and we need to value that. Um, and it will it will. And so I I I'm more and more convinced, although I'm not an economist. That this uh, the idea of a uni universal basic income is the way we should be going instead of the sort of you have a job or you have unemployment pay. I think this idea of a universal basic income so, and so everyone feels valued and but but we encourage um, uh, people to support the community generally. Um, and you could argue, I mean, some cities, we already have it, I think, in the city, I believe it's Bristol in the UK, has a sort of a barter system whereby they, they barter skills to help in the community. And, um, you know, I, I, there's so many, when you, th you think about the care for the elderly or the disabled or people with learning difficulties or all the issues that we have where those skills are hugely needed so that people can have a quality of life. Um, and and I think we this is a chance, and the pandemic has just fueled this idea that we could really think about a different social contract. So I'm just having a question coming in from the audience. Um, so, but actually, I think it's quite interesting as well. Um, so, how likely do you think is the introduction of a universal basic income? So, how I mean, actually, to, to both of you, I mean, to Martin. <laughs> Yeah, actually, to, to Martin then, so how, how can we reach that? How can we achieve that? I've, I've always thought that it would probably take some time, and I, and I think history shows that, that um, for us to do something that admittedly radical relative to what we've done before, we need to have a crisis, you know, that, that these things don't tend to happen because of smooth planning. I mean, if you look at, back at the Great Depression, that's what... Um, cost the United States to basically have things like social security and unemployment insurance for the first time. It took that, that massive crisis for that to happen. And I've always thought that, you know, the same is probably going to be true for, for basic income. So probably things will have to get worse before they get better. Um, I would say that in the last few years, it's definitely, you know, I've become more optimistic. In part, that's because of COVID. Um, you do see programs that, that in many places begin to look a little bit like a basic income. The United States, we actually uh, sent out, you know, so-called stimulus checks, $1,200 to everyone, which is, you know, something something that, that begins to look like a basic income, right? If you start doing that on a monthly basis. Um, the other thing that happened in the U.S. was uh, the, the Democratic presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, right, who ran and got a lot of attention. Um, and built a huge following um, on on this theme of actually having what he called a, a freedom dividend, you know, basically a, a basic income for citizens, which is something that happened a lot sooner than I would have expected to see it in the U.S. So this is now something that is kind of on the, the radar. People are, are aware of it in a way that I think that they weren't previously, but still I suspect it's going to be a while before um, a program like this is really adopted. And I think the place to start is probably with smaller pilot program, programs to test it um, with different parameters so we, we can learn more about um, you know, how it might actually work before we, we actually implement it on, on national scales. 
Thanks. Um, yeah, so, I mean, let's hope if COVID-19 does any good, that it enables new ways um, of thinking in um, yeah, new directions. Um, I have another question actually to the two of you um, regarding automation. Um, because I have the feeling that AI, so be it a robot or a software, um, is really marketed as working perfectly. You know, like there's a smooth automation, we don't need any human um, intervention and interaction. And then I read about companies who employ millions of people just uh, to check for the big internet companies if their AI does actually what it should do. For example, when it comes to search engines, I mean, there are millions of people just checking manually if it works and improve the algorithms. Um, so. Is it really a myth that we are on a way to this smooth, perfect techno world? Or will we always need humans who have an oversight or evaluate if the machines are actually doing what we want them to do? Who wants to start? Uh, I, I guess I can start. Um, it certainly isn't perfect, and, but it is clearly getting better. Um, and it will get dramatically better, I think, over the next decade. Um, but it's true, there are always, I think, at least for the foreseeable future, there will always be a place for people um, in the process. Um, but there are two questions, how many people and what kinds of jobs, you know, are they gonna be? Um, and, and you mentioned all these people that are working with search engines and things like that. Like, for example, you've got people that, um, you know, moderate content, right? You've got people that work for, for companies like Twitter looking for pornographic images and, 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 and things like that, that that work in the Philippines, very low wage workers. And, you know, yes, they are jobs, but they are very, in a sense, dehumanizing jobs, right? I mean, this is kind of what we're seeing is that in many environments, as, as automation and AI gets better, the machines take over most of it, but then there are certain things that can't be done yet because the technology isn't advanced enough yet and so humans kind of step into that role but they almost are being used almost like a a neural net that is plugged into the system to do to do something that an artificial neural network can't do so you use a, a human neural network to do it right so that is not necessarily um you know the the, the, the kind of job that most people dream of it, it tends to be very rote repetitive and kind of dehumanizing so um, that's another problem. So it's getting more and more proficient um, and it's going to have a bigger and bigger impact over time. So, Wendy, what's your take on this? Well, I'm not um, as pessimistic as Martin, partly because I want to see, um, I, I talk about we need to keep the human in the loop. And certainly at the moment we do. Um, because the systems are by no means perfect, they, but, you know, and this, the issues of uh, bias and um, ensuring that the um, decisions that are made are checked and, and there are checks and balances about making sure um, the, the systems are behaving as they should. Um, and at, that in itself needs to be interpreted. Um, and I think that um, we are going to see a proliferation of um, AI regulation coming out um, across the world generally. In, I, I draw the analogy with um, the way that we have financial regulation. You know, every, every company has to declare it's uh, across the world largely, it may have started in the UK, but um, every company has to declare it's, um, uh, uh, its accounts at the end of the year um, show that they haven't done anything corrupt or illegal and they have to be audited by a third party company um, to prove the directors are behaving properly. Um, this system has emerged over many centuries actually but certainly in the last um, decades um, to quite a big industry in itself. And I think we're going to see that it'll be the same but different with AI. I think companies that use AI, and that in itself is not, some companies claim they're using AI, what is AI, you know, and other companies use AI but don't tell you. But, um, you know, so this is not clear cut, but generally we're going to have to have some sort of regulation where companies who use AI systems are audited in some way and that will and again create a new whole new industry and that auditing could it 
could mean testing the output of the AI algorithms against some benchmark that the company may um, set up. This is what we say our algorithm does. Here's some test runs to prove it does what it does and to prove it's not biased and doesn't, you know, choose the wrong people or tell people they've got an illness when they haven't and vice versa. And, all, and so important in things like self-driving cars and, you know, the, 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 these, the, this sort of regulation, we don't want to over-regulate because we want to stimu stimulate innovation, we want to allow innovation, but on the other hand, we want checks and balances to make sure that people are not being hurt or um, abused or um, whatever, you know, discriminated against by the systems. So this will create an industry of its own. Um, we have to get the balance right between government regulation and what companies do themselves and what citizens' rights are in all this. Um, and we've seen the rise of the tech companies, the data gopolies who have done so far not had any regulation at all really about what they do. And that's just coming to the fore now as uh, that's a big challenge um, for society as to how we handle that, how, the, how government, different governments handle that. There are lots of employment prospects in all this. And I would also say something like um, taking the health sector where it's, it's generally admitted that in the health sector, the use of AI is going to create efficiencies um, because if you're scanning, say, um, if, you're, if you're trying to detect a, a cancerous tumor in uh, lots of scans, AI can do that. It is being shown more efficiently, more accurately than a human being. But I would argue very much that at the moment you, you well, firstly, that, re, that means that the human being doesn't have that boring job to do. So they can do something to do with patients or they can, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, something that AI can't do in terms of handling the human beings and the patients themselves. Or yeah. But also, I think it's really important that at the moment, because these systems are not perfect, um, we, we absolutely need uh, the human in the loop to check uh, that um, the results are accurate and that people are not being given the wrong results and told the wrong, you know, th there's got to be human checks in there. So I think I'm arguing both that we need the human in the loop, loop at the moment and that um, this in itself um, will lead to a whole new industry in terms of what I, I you know, explain. So I, we talk about explainable AI. We have a major issue going forward in the, 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 the deep learning algorithms. It is really, you can't, they cannot explain what they, how they make their decisions. It's really difficult. So we're, we've got, we're spawning a whole industry that's trying to understand what the deep learning, the decisions a deep learning system makes, or maybe detect a deep fake. And, and my, my, my worry about that is that it's a holy grail that we'll never because that be able to reach because uh, it's just a cat and mouse game. But this will again spawn a whole new um, industry. Whether all these... Um, the dehumanisation, it's interesting, it's all relative. I think about kids going up chimneys in the Victorian days, and I think about the fights we had when I was a student with the coal miners going on strike because they wanted the right to go down into a coal mine. And you sort of think about it now, 50 years on, and you think, why would you fight for people to work underground in those dreadful, very dangerous conditions where machines can do it much better? So I think it's all relative. So now you touched upon many, many important um, topics. Um, maybe let's go back to the health sector. Um, so Tom Ford, question to you. Do you in fact think that um, doctors could spend more time with patients um, if we have more artificial intelligence software like doing diagnosis or whatever? Or do you actually think that the system will just um, become faster and faster and put more pressure on um, the doctors? That was for me? Yeah, that was for you. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't worry too much about doctors. Again, doctors are extremely skilled workers, right? They have enormous amounts of education. Um, so it's true. If, if uh, you have an algorithm that can read um, cancer scans or, or x-rays, then, then a radiologist maybe will work more with patients or, or oversee the process. I think it will be a long time before, before uh, doctors are completely out of the loop. I mean, as Wendy said, we do need people to check these results and so forth. Uh, but again, these are very high skill jobs. And the people that I worry most about are not, you know, people in medicine, but maybe people working at, at McDonald's, right? I mean, um, 
or people doing lower end clerical work and so forth. Um, I do think there's a lot of opportunity in healthcare. You already see robots being deployed in hospitals and things like that. So there, there could be an impact there. Um, but that's really, rather than something that I would worry about, it's more of a massive opportunity because, because we really do need to, to rein in health costs and so forth. Yes. Um, yes. What, what I worry about are, are really other kinds of workers, which are gonna be predominantly in other industries. Um, and, and taking one of those people that loses a job in those industries and then training them to necessarily do the kind of thing that Wendy was just talking about, you know, having them check AI or audit AI and things like that simply may not be realistic. So I, I do worry about potentially quite a large fraction of our workforce being... No, left. when 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 I'm old and can't do it myself, I want them to come and do my garden for me. Right? I can't, and I want that, to, and I want them to, you know, I want them to help um, uh, in a way that is valued, right? And and I think there's all sorts of um, jobs, community type roles that people we can, um, if we if we go the route of a universal basic income, uh, that uh, you know, we we can. That, that supports and is compassionate within a community um, uh, that, that it's, it's not about having to retrain into an AI job if, if people aren't um, able to do that. I think there's, there's plenty of work that needs to be done that we don't find ways to get done at the moment. And a lot of that is to do with caring for people and helping people who can't help themselves. So then what would you suggest? How should we change the educational system? What improvements could we oh, do? No, that's different. Now you're talking about something different. I mean, we're, we're, we're here talking about people who lose their jobs and you know, can't retrain to some, a new type of job. And I think it's really important to, um, as with all, uh, you know, as you have a revolution, you need to make sure that in, in, in an in industrial revolution of some sort, you need to make sure that the children coming in are well um, educated to, to be able to do the new types of jobs. Um, yeah, but then actually the, the question was the more directed to um, Tom Ford, because if there... <laughs> are not enough new jobs actually so how would we educate the young people so what changes needs to be done in the educational system well i mean the best advice you can give is don't educate people to do you know fundamentally routine jobs where they come to work and do the same kind of thing again and again which means emphasizing things like creativity um you know the ability to work with other people um these are the things that are hard to automate, right? At least for the time being, maybe eventually even that will be automated, but, but coming up with genuinely, genuinely new ideas, thinking outside the box, building something entirely new. These are things that people are good at and right now machines are not good at. And the other thing is, is really working with people, building relationships, having empathy for another person, um, building you know, very sophisticated interpersonal connections. Um, these are things that people are uniquely good at and someday machines may compete there too, but not yet. Mm -hmm. So these are probably the areas where we want to make particularly sure our education system is focused on. Um, but again, that, that, that isn't necessarily a universal solution. Some people are going to have innate personality traits and talents that are going to make them better at those kinds of things. I mean, I've mentioned creativity. Is creativity something that you can teach or is that an innate quality. Um, you either have or you don't have. Um, it's kind of unclear, right? But you, we can do what we can in our education system. Um, and it, even setting this stuff aside, it's got huge problems just getting people at basic standards of being able to read and write um, in many you know, schools in, in, in the United States. So, I mean, there's a huge challenge there ahead of us, right? I mean, I mean if you really are not even at the point where you're literate, um, then as our society becomes more and more complex and more technological and there are even fewer of the kinds of jobs that might be appropriate for that kind of person, then it's going to get harder and harder. So yeah, education is a huge challenge that I think no one really has all the answers to at all. But I see also some, some agreement between the two of you on that side as well when it comes to education. Well, you see, I'd agree totally with Martin. And I think um, things like, and we do, some schools will do this today, where you take, you know, you get kids out into the community 
and show them what it means to help in the community, take them to see, uh, old, old folks' homes, whatever you call them these days, or to help with old elderly people who, you know, every generation will have their elderly generation that can't use the new gadgets. Whatever those new gadgets are, as you get older, you find it much harder to adapt to the new technologies. And, um, you know, as our homes become more and more... Um, uh, te uh, te driven by technology when things break you know people who are um, uh, I, I know as I get older I'm more concerned about this right as my arthritis grows in my hands and I need someone to help me do simple things um, and the same with uh, learning new technologies I mean I'm still fine about learning new technologies but the generation above me isn't right? They can't use smartphones very easily. It's really hard. My mother was 96. She couldn't use, she was a very bright woman, but she really found it hard to get her head around a mobile phone, a simple, not a simple one. And then when things go wrong, you need someone to fix it. And, and you need that to be in a safe way and not, you know, and so I think there's all sorts of, and I'm, there's also the other end of the scale is helping people with young children. Um, and, and I think if we get kids out into the community as part of their education um, to learn the sorts of skills Martin's talking about and even if even if you've got someone who's a bit on the autistic spectrum they can still go into an elderly person's home and help them fix something right you can still make that happen so I think that um, uh, we need to be creative about the way we do this and that education will probably should stop being just people sitting in classrooms at desks listening to the teacher. Yeah, actually, um, thanks. I wanted to touch um, upon another topic because then, Wendy, you um, before mentioned also biases when we were talking about this perfect techno world. And um, this leads me actually to a follow up question um, because you were recently appointed to the new Commission on AI Governance and Public Policy and um, from the Oxford University. Yes. yes. And um, I think there are many scandals around in the world when it comes to um, the application of AI in public policy. And um, I just instantly um, remember this summer um, when there was an algorithm used to generate um, the exams or the grades of, yeah. of students and then it was um, unfairly biased. And um, how do you see your role in this commission when it comes to public policy? Because before we were talking also about companies and about regulation for companies, but what what is it when it comes to, to the public, to well, the state? It isn't just, I mean, my role in the commission is what the, you know, the people at the OAI are running the commission. I'm just one, effectively as a commissioner, I'm an advisor, right, to them. So I let them, uh, but I think that generally, I mean, I've got a cup, I've got things all over my desk here um, of AI ethics frameworks that are beginning to emerge and how, you know, how to, how to stop it, how to, again, the checks and balances about checking whether an algorithm works or not. And that, that one about the, um, the prediction of A-level grades that we had in the UK this summer, which was an absolute disaster. It wasn't even really AI, but it was a decision-making system. And um, it went horribly wrong, but it wasn't because the algorithm was wrong. The algorithm did what it was designed to do, but it was designed badly um, with not thought through the consequences. And it was tested on the wrong data. It was tested on the previous year's, um, I can't remember, it should have been tested on predicted grades from the previous year and it was detected tested on absolutely final grades and so that this is an example of how not to do it it's a classic example of how not to do it it ruined a few people's lives along the way and these are the lessons we need to learn and and um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in public sector in helping the civil servants get up to speed with what they've got to do in terms of checking whether an algorithm is fit for purpose or whether it's been um, going to have unexpected consequences not just be biased and um, you were talking about um, checks and balances. And we have another question um, from the audience, from uh, Antonia Berg. And um, she actually lifts it a level higher. Um, she asks, can a system of checks and balances work with so many actors worldwide? So now we are not only talking about national governments, or com but how, how, could we, how could we work on that? Maybe to Martin, do you have? It's a hard question. 
Yeah, I mean, right whole, audience, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that regulating artificial intelligence is going to be um, a huge challenge, um, mm -hmm. even, even at the national level, let alone at the international level. I mean, obviously, one of the dynamics there is that there's there's very definite competition between the U.S. and Western countries and China, for example, right? And this 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 is something that is going to have a very big impact in, in many ways in the future, and you know, going right to national security. It's and and artificial intelligence is everywhere. It's going to impact everything. It's going to have obviously military applications. So, you know, we worry about autonomous weapons, things like this, really scary things, as well as um, issues around bias and fairness and and uh, the potential for deep fakes that could just. I mean, you can imagine big videos that that. Could, I mean, you've seen the impact of, of viral videos, you know, in the United States in terms of the unrest and things that, that can happen. I mean, you can imagine some nefarious player creating fake videos of, of very high fidelity that are intended to, to you know, to, to cause, you know, explosive unrest or something. So there are huge issues there that we're going to have to deal with. This is one of the most important things for sure. And there's no easy answer to it. Um, I think that we're going to have to, I, you know, one thing I advocate for is a, is a specific agency. Um, something like the FDA regulates, you know, drugs. We may need a specific agency um, at the national level to, to regulate artificial intelligence. And maybe every country will have that and maybe they'll all coordinate and there'll be an international scheme or something. But that, you know, we're going to need something, I think, on that, that sort of a level. I am... Um... I because I, I'm looking at eye on the time. I totally agree with Martin on that. There is something called the Global Partnership in AI that's emerging, uh, which is being led by Canada and France, and um, most of the Western democracies and other are signed up. Uh, but China's not part of that, um, and and I find, I think that's a real I, a real issue because. China is a major, I've been writing about this recently. I mean, China is a, is, is very, becoming quite, quite dominant and it's 20% or more of the world's population. And it actually, uh, you may not agree with the way the China, you know, the government, the way the, 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 the way the government works in China, but it's, it is, it is dominating a significant chunk of the world. It's uh, in bringing the internet and they are into Africa and a lot of Southeast Asia is dependent on China and, um, so I think ignoring China, we have to work with them in this type of regulation. We have to work out what we can agree on and where we differ and, and some regu you know, because we're going to, we're going to be trading in these types of systems. So I don't think you can afford to duck that conversation, but otherwise I agree, I agree with Martin about uh, this. Has to, we, we have to think of it at a global, global level. Yeah. I think this um, also kind of answers another question from the audience from, from uh, Catherine McGovern, who asked um, how we could counteract the negative and even fearful attitude of the public towards AI, probably with um, agreements and regulation, then if I, if I understood you right. Um, so we are really running towards the end of the conversation. So I wanted to ask you to end with... Um, with a question and ask for um, a short answer maybe. What do you think is more important or more relevant or what would you put first? Data ethics or AI ethics? Well, I would say you can't choose. You cannot, you absolutely cannot separate them because today, it wasn't true earlier when I started AI came out of philosophy but today AI really means machine learning and in the future it will mean something else but today it means machine learning and machine learning deep learning neural net it's all based about training on data and you have to know about the data the quality of that data you have to and, and the management of it and so I don't think you can uh, distinguish between the two you can I think they have to be considered together is my view. Martin you have any comment on that? Well, I certainly agree with that. Yes, I mean, you know, the smartest algorithm isn't worth anything without the data that, that it's trained on. So those two things go together. But I, I would just say that this is a huge issue, whether you want to call it ethics or whether you want to just, just call it inclusiveness. The, the key idea here is that we want to make sure that artificial intelligence is a positive force for humanity. And we want to make sure that everyone benefits. So we, we want to make sure that it's not used in nefarious ways to harm people make us worse off and we want to make sure that that's true of everyone and, and it's not biased against certain groups or 
economically, certain groups are left behind. So thank you for this closing remarks, actually. Um, thank you to both of you, Wendy Hall and Martin Ford, for this very insightful and interesting conversation. And um, yeah, have a nice evening. And I give back to Mr. Lenz. Isabella, thank you very much for moderating this very interesting final stretch to the final finishing line of our five-day conference. And I'm very pleased with the audience. I mean, you stayed with us through five days. It was a long stretch. But I hope that we not only could entertain you, but also attract you, not only by the speakers, but also by the topics. And let me say, it was not only a stress test for all the ones involved, it was also an experiment because it was a very complex and highly technical issues. And let's look back to the five days and some impressions which I would like to share with you. Where are they? I think we are still working on the impressions, but you still can see our speakers from the last session. And I think if Technic is involved, they are loading it up. And hopefully we see some live pictures in a sec. Martin, you are still watching us. So maybe you're one of the live pictures, which we still have. And now I think we are coming close to sharing with you some of the impressions of the last five days. Let me say what we did. We looked at the impact of COVID-19. We looked at different sectors and professions. We looked at the German EU presidency. We looked at speakers from Europe, the US and beyond, citizens, policymakers, security experts, innovators, economists, philosophers, union organizers. We had them all. And the leitmotif from this week, full of panels, presentations and conversations, was a rather positive one. It was one showing us that we, the public, you, are shaping the future of AI. And it is all also about embedded values which are close and dear to our hearts. This is what is important. The diversity, fairness, trustworthiness in AI, and promote a healthy AI tech and political ecosystem. That was what we had in mind, and I hope that we at least achieved some of it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let me again thank our major partners which made this extraordinary event possible. First and foremost, the Heinz and Heide Dürr Stiftung, the Baden-Württemberg Landesvertretung State Representation in Berlin, who made it possible to build a full-fledged studio on their premises, which we have seen throughout our short impression um, slides. There is also to thank the Google, Dell, Microsoft, Friedrich Naumann Foundation, our media partners Tagesspiegel, DNVGL, as well as Internationale Politik and Internationale Politik Quarterly. And now you might ask yourself, what are we doing next? Yes, we already are planning ahead for 2021. Maybe our next topic will be humanity empowered, building resilience of AI and with AI. As countries worldwide trying to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, we are all challenged with the question, how to put more resilience in our societies in politics and the economy. And AI might be one of the most important answers. So please stay tuned because next year will come and next year Aspen will be back with another conference. But now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say a couple of personal words. I had the honor and the pleasure to serve the Aspen Institutes for seven years at the helm. And it is now my swan song, but Having been the director of the Aspen Institute was pleasure because I had a team which was so dedicated to its task, and you all see them now on the screen. Olivia, Tobia from our digital department, 
And then there is Monica, there is Wiebke, Laura. This is a black screen. They are not all looking that way. I think we are still looking for the team. Where is the team? Maybe here they are. You see my team. And they will be serving my successor, who will be a person you all have already met on Monday. It is Stomi Annika Mildner, who will certainly lead this team into new directions and into new, to new goals and objectives. And she, as well as the team, will work closely together to serve you and bring you up to new frontiers and new solutions. Here is Stormy. You have seen her on Monday. And I'm very proud to hand over the baton to her. And this is a surprise because people are now surrounding me. This is the head of our <laughs> board. Eckhard von Kleden, chairman of the board. Weapons with roses. With weapons and roses. <laughs> and this is Roland Hofmann-Teiner, the chairman of the Friends of Aspen, Germany. I'm totally surprised. And I think now they have to do the work and to talk. Please, go on. Who is first? Lieber Rüdiger, du hast darauf hingewiesen, was für ein fantastisches Team dich unterstützt hat. Aber dieses Team würde es nicht geben ohne deine Führung. Du hast Espen in den letzten sieben Jahren zu dem gemacht, was es heute ist. Du hast es wieder an die Spitze geführt der transatlantischen Organisation. Du hast das getan mit Zeit, mit Engagement, mit Intelligenz, mit Herzblut, mit Menschlichkeit, mit Umsicht, mit Freundschaft. Die Liste wäre sehr, sehr lang und äh, gäbe es nicht Covid, würden wir dir alle einen Kuss geben. Aber das, äh, die Pandemie be äh, bewahrt dich davor. Wir werden im nächsten Jahr, wenn die Pandemie hinter uns ist, auch noch die Gelegenheit nutzen, dir sehr, sehr herzlich in angemessener Weise dafür zu danken. Aber wir beide, Roland und ich, wollen das heute in dieser Audience tun. Ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank. Du hast dich um Espen verdient gemacht. Du hast dich um die transatlantischen Beziehungen verdient gemacht. Du hast etwas geleistet, das mir jetzt schwerfällt, in Worte zu fassen. Und jeder, der weiß, was ich für eine Labertasche bin, der äh, kann das ermessen. Rudi, ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank. Mit dem gehörigen Abstand. I feel honored. I think this is the first time. First time in my life that I get red roses. And they will be for my beloved wife Petra, who owes a great part of my success, my team's success and the success of Aspen. This is not saying there's always a strong woman behind a man. She is just lovely and she knows how to treat me and maybe I learned a lot from her how to treat other people. Thank you so much. Vielen Dank, lieber Eckert. I'm overwhelmed. Not speechless. That's not the way I work, but thank you so much. <laughs> Rüdiger, ich spreche auch auf Deutsch dich an, weil ich für die Freunde, die deutschen Freunde spreche und möchte mich dem Dank von Eckert im Besonderen anschließen. Du bist vor sieben Jahren ob deines, deiner reifen Berufserfahrung als Übergangskandidat geholt worden und nach kurzer Zeit hat man festgestellt, was es wirklich heißt, was, es in, dir, was in dir steckt. Und ähm, du bist in gewisser Weise die Personalisierung des Gedankens von Renaissance oder Revitalisierung. Denn du hast in der Tat Aspen äh, revitalisiert. Ähm, du hast ähm, ein Team zusammengefügt, was es vorher in der Form nicht gegeben hat. Du hast immer geführt mit großem Engagement und verbunden mit Werten. Und da stehst du in der besten Aspen-Tradition, die man sich nur vorstellen kann. Du hast Werte in eine, Diskus in, eine, in, eine, in, eine Zeit, in eine Zeit gebracht, die manchmal geprägt war von Irrationalismen. Und du personifiziertest auch insofern immer den Gedanken, wir müssen Rationalität in unsere Diskussion hineinbringen, Werte in die Diskussion hineinbringen. Und insofern hast du die Espenfackel im besten Sinne in den letzten Jahren hier in Berlin und weit über Berlin hinaus in die Welt getragen. Ähm, es, wenn wir zurückblicken, hat es einige starke ähm, Direktoren gegeben, aber ich glaube, ähm, 
man wird im Rückblick sagen müssen, es gab Shepard Stone und es gab Rüdiger Lenz. Ähm, ähm, und äh, in diesem Sinne ähm, hast du und hinterlässt du ganz große Fußstapfen, ähm, so wie Shepard Stones einstmals große Fußstapfen hinterlassen hat. Stormy ähm, wird mit unserer Hilfe äh, diese Fußstapfen zu, zu füllen versuchen und wir sind sehr zuversichtlich, dass ihr das gelingen wird. Und gleichwohl, du hast einen riesen Anteil an dieser Revitalisierung. Und ich wollte jetzt nicht einen weiteren Strauß ähm, ähm, Rosen dir schenken, sondern äh, etwas, etwas Männlicheres, nämlich, ähm, äh, <lacht> äh, nämlich Bourbon. Was steht am besten sozusagen für transatlantische Exportartikel, insbesondere in Richtung Osten sozusagen? Das ist Bourbon. Und dieser Bourbon hat auch einen wunderschönen Namen, nämlich Heaven's Door. Ähm, äh, äh, Heaven's Door bedeutet nicht, Not yet there. ja, 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 aber nach einer halben Flasche äh, äh, könnte man sozusagen <lacht> schon äh, dort anklopfen. Ähm, die letzten vier Jahre transatlantische Beziehungen waren so, dass man manchmal geneigt war, am Abend eine halbe Flasche davon trinken zu wollen. Ich glaube und hoffe, dass in den nächsten Jahren du viel, viel sozusagen mehr daran nippen musst, weil du vielleicht die Beziehung in einem Lichte siehst, dass du sagst, es lohnt sich, darauf wieder anzustoßen. In diesem Sinne noch einmal vielen, vielen Dank für all dein Wirken. Alles Gute in der Zukunft. Thank you all and again I take this as also a gratitude to my team uh, which I regret uh, that I have to leave them not forever but at the end of this year uh, because it was fun it was a lot of uh, joy it was sometimes confrontation but all, always a very fruitful dialogue and I'd like to keep it that way also for my successor, Stormy, who already knows how to treat this team the way it needs and it deserves. So thank you again to my team. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Eckhart. And uh, I'm not riding in the sunset yet, but I can say what he said about revitalizing Aspen. Uh, this is sort of a drug, not the bourbon, which I hold in my hand now. Aspen, if you live for it, for its goals, is sort of an infectious disease, much better than COVID. Thank you so much, and I say goodbye. Wow. <laughs>